I'd like to welcome you to the communications forum for this Thursday. I'm David Thorburn, professor of literature and director of the MIT Communications Forum. Uh, I'm especially excited about today's event. Uh, Marty and uh, Martin Marks, who's the moderator and, and uh, organizer of this event, has been talking about a project of this kind to me for a long time, and I'm very happy it's finally come to fruition. Uh, Marty will explain, w w will introduce his speakers and, and, and set the parameters of his discussion. But uh, I, I would like first to remind folks that there is one final forum uh, uh, scheduled for this semester. It's listed uh, on the website, as you can see, and it actually serves as the inaugural event or opening event of a conference, uh, the sixth annual, the sixth biannual, uh, biannual mean every two years? I hope so, because that's what I mean. Uh, the, sixth, uh, the sixth Media in Transition conference, uh, you can uh, find out about it on the website. There's a, the, the, uh, I hope many of you who are not already registered to attend will choose to do so. Uh, and that uh, final, for, uh, final forum uh, is on April 23rd, a Thursday, at our usual time. Uh, but it's in a different space, as you can see, uh, uh, to, to uh, link it to the conference events, which will follow on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And we have a, uh, it's a very interesting uh, conference, which uh, I think we've had, we had something like almost 300 uh, uh, applicants to deliver papers at the conference. Uh, and a significant proportion of them, I think more than half, are from abroad. So it's the most internationally diverse conference we've ever, we've ever run, uh, and it should be quite an exciting event. There is no uh, uh, admission fee. I hope uh, some of you in the audience will make the time to uh, attend some of the events. And uh, there's a full agenda for the events, both the great large plenary public conversations we're planning, as well as uh, a series of smaller breakout sessions in which individual scholars will deliver short papers on topics connected to the uh, theme of the conference. So I urge all of you to uh, look at that if you can. It's, it, it's now a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce my, my, fr my, fr my longtime friend and colleague, Professor Martin Marks, who teaches in the music and theater arts section at MIT and has been, since its inception, a mainstay of the media studies program at MIT. Uh, Martin, uh, Marty, Marty is the author of a pioneering book on, uh, on uh, film music called Music and the Silent Film from Oxford in 1997. And uh, more recently, he's engaged in a scholarly project that may have even greater impact than that wonderful book. It's a, a, a series of DVDs that he's collaborating with, collaborating with other scholars on. Uh, the first three sets, which he wrote uh, notes for concerning the music, is called Treasures from the, from the American Film Archives. Uh, and the first three sets were published over the period from the years 2000 to 2007. Uh, 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 more more uh, uh, subsets of the series are planned, and one such uh, devoted to the silent f Western film is one that uh, Marty has already begun to work on. And uh, it's, a, it's an immensely illuminating and powerful series because the notes alone are, are worth the price of admission, but of course you can also watch these silent uh, films and watch them with musical uh, accompaniment, mu much of which Marty has helped to create and, uh, and organize. Uh, so he's been working in this field for a considerable time himself and is a, 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 a real uh, a, a, has major standing in the field of film music, and as you'll see, the colleagues he's gathered around him have at least an equal claim on our attention. Marty Marks. Thank you, David. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm really delighted to be here with uh, Paul and Dan, my panelists, um, our panelists. Um, who are both very distinguished, and I want to introduce them to you myself in just a moment. I wanted to start by uh, picking up on some of David's own pioneering work in return for uh, thanking him for, for his nice introduction of me. Um, David has for a long time run uh, conferences and classes under the heading Media in Transition, and this has been um, one of the key themes of media studies at MIT. And I've been thinking about how to introduce this panel on uh, film music and digital media. 
And I started to think about the, the concept of media in transition, and it just seems to me that there's no way to talk about film as an art form and as a technological form without talking about it as a media in perpetual state of transition. There is no such thing as a stable medium called film. It has been constantly changed from year to year, from decade to decade, sometimes almost from month to month or day to day in terms of the technological tools that drive the medium. And in that respect, um, my own work has long focused primarily at, at one end of the history of film, um, the silent film with live musical accompaniment. And in working in that area, my original experiences were to take scores or cre create scores of my own and play them live to silent film to try to recreate the experience of silent film and live music as it was developed during the primarily during the teens and 20s, although it goes back to the 1890s in some respects. But with the coming of the DVD project especially, it's like I've leapfrogged to the other end of the history of the medium because uh, now I'm sitting there recording scores for DVDs with time-coded film. I've got an engineer up in the booth with Pro Tools and all the other things. I've got crashing technology every 10 minutes, which interrupts the scores that I'm trying to prepare or record or practice. I've got all those things going on, and I feel like I'm getting this medium from both ends or working the medium from both ends. And it's driven home to me more than ever what a fascinating and rich medium film is and film music because of this constantly changing digital uh, environment that we're in today, which is only an extension of the changes before. In fact, there's a tendency to th theorize the history of sound and film um, by talking about two revolutions in film sound. The first sound revolution is, of course, the coming of the technology of sound recording to film in the mid to late 20s, and the crisis that that provoked, the transition that that provoked, um, to a brand new, in a way, way of making films, designing them for sound as well as image. The second sound revolution, as it's often called today, was the one that began in the late 60s but really occurred during the 70s. And it's really the revolution more from the aesthetic point of view, as much, or at least as much from the aesthetic point of view as from the technological point of view. It's the revolution in sound design. Um, it's the idea that we suddenly start to talk about people like Walter Murch as key creative figures in the making of film. Now, this is there would long been people who were vital to in sound and film. You can go back in the history. But there's a new awareness of sound technology and of sound's potential in the 70s. So that really changed the way people heard movies and saw movies um, tremendously. Now, of course, we're in the third revolution, which I think is a revolution that will never stop as long as there are new digital innovations. I, I certainly don't feel that this panel can talk about a stable new world of film music um, that things have changed and we want to try to freeze the frame for a few minutes and talk about what's happening now and how things have changed from both the very far past and the more recent past of film scoring techniques. So with that, that's my overview right now and I want to turn to Paul first and Dan second but let me introduce them together. Um, First of all, as far as Paul Chahar is concerned, <laughs> he's an old friend of mine. We've, we've known each other for many years, and so we are buddy-buddy, and we're going to treat each other like that. But he is also a very distinguished person in the field. He is now the chair of visual media at UCLA. Um, th that is, he runs their graduate film music program, and um, he's taught off and on at UCLA in the past, but now he's got this full-time job which is taking up more time than he wants, I think, because he's still got a lot of other things to do. Over the decades since the 70s, he's composed at least 100 film scores and music for many TV series. He's worked with directors um, such as, Lu uh, distinguished directors such as Sidney Lumet, Arthur Penn, Louis Moll, and John Turturro. Um, his credits, uh, in, the, in, the, in his younger days, his credits included some really interesting films that 
are underappreciated for their music, which is often the case. Um, Prince of the City, Crossing Delancey, The Morning After, which has a marvelous score. I've always had a soft spot for that movie. And the TV series, China Beach. But um, he's also got some other interesting credits that people are not apt to know about. He's a member of the team of four that first produced the American versions of Miyazaki's animated features for Walt Disney, um, including Coco posing the score for a film called Kiki's Delivery Service. And he's a member of the, uh, he, well, sorry, he received the award of Composer of the Year from the Classical Recording Foundation in 2009. Um, in fact, as much as he's done in the world of film, he's done a tremendous amount of concert music. And in fact, there's a world premiere of his viola concerto next month with the Cleveland Orchestra. So he's busy on many fronts. And I wish I could mention all his film scores. Now let's go to Dan very quickly, because Dan is the, as far as I can see, there's no more important figure in the music editing world of film scoring today. Um, he's, his current title right now, since 2007, is Chair of Film Scoring at Berkeley College of Music just across the river. And if you know your film scoring, you know that Berkeley is turning out major composers all the time now who are bi-coastal. They're going from here to Hollywood and making major careers. Um, from 2004 to 2007, he was the executive director of the Mancini Institute of Los Angeles, which has become an important uh, kind of foundational source of, uh, of money and, and support for film composers. From 2003 to 5, he was chair of the Board of Trustees of the Grammy uh, organization, the Recording Academy. And from 1980 to 2003, he was the chief executive officer of Segway Music in LA, which is the industry's largest provider of music supervisors, su supervision, and music editing services. So even if you don't see his name on the films, you, his hand has been in them in one way or another. And he's also an M Emmy Award winning music editor, um, nominated for music direction, for conducting, um, he's worked on several award-winning films, including The Black Stallion, An Officer and a Gentleman, The Temptations, What the Love Got to Do With It, and Last of the Mohicans. And he's going to talk a little later about one technical area that he did some, some groundbreaking work in during the beta testing of Pro Tools systems. Um, he, he was working, uh, he directed that um, testing, or he oversaw the first digital delivery of music soundtracks of a motion picture um, for the cr with the creator of that, Digi Design. So he can tell us a lot about technical aspects. Um, these are very busy men, and I'm really grateful for them to coming over here and taking their time to... It's one of the reasons I've had so much trouble getting together a film music panel, my dream panel of five composers and five editors is because they're all happen. too damn busy. Yeah, you know, it's you, just not going to happen. They're never going to happen. No. So we have to take what we get, but I'm really glad we got what we've taken. So yeah. without further ado, I'd like to have Paul well, start us off. Yes, I should have reminded you, the first hour is conversation. The second hour is talk with you with questions and back and forth. So we won't get all our points made. There'll be plenty of things for you to ask about. Um, and so we've got to move on to Paul because he's got some wonderful material to present to us. Um, and it, oh, he's going to focus first on King Kong, the recent version with the score by James Newton Howard. But I thought imp before he did that, to appreciate some of the points he's making and to appreciate the point I was making about film music and film being in perpetual transition, I'd like to show you one brief clip from the 1933 King Kong, because he's going to show us how that clip was reworked and how music plays a role and sound plays a role in the new version's approach to the same sequence. This, of course, is the 1933 King Kong, a landmark of special effects um, in the visual sense, and also a landmark of soundtrack making, both in terms of technology and in terms of the aesthetic results. There were two figures who were key f pioneers in this soundtrack. One was Maurice Spivak, the sound editor, who had to make up sounds that had never been made up before. How do you make an ape's roar, you know, when he's 200 feet tall or whatever he is? What does it sound like? What do his footsteps sound like? 
And then Max Steiner had to write a score for this fantasy, uh, this weird, bizarre, this weird fantasy of a trip to a non-existent skull island where these non-existent natives do their strange dances and have their savage rituals of sacrifice to the giant ape. Um, this is the sequence where Kong first appears. It comes about 30 minutes into the film. There's been a long buildup of suspense in a number of ways. And it's at this point that the music and the sound effects really start to take over. There's been a long series of subdued music, and before that, for the first 15, 20 minutes of the film after the opening credits, there's no music until we get to the unreal world of Skull Island. The realistic scenes don't have music. Steiner was originally, was very uh, shrewd in conceiving that approach. Nobody had ever tried a score for, you know, a, a score that didn't start with the picture and just roll through it. He knew when to bring the music in. When Kong appears, he uses his big theme for Kong, which is basically bom, bom, bom. That's it. But that's the Kong theme, and it's very elemental. But you'll hear a lot of other things, including a gong and a lot of screaming. Let's watch this clip. A lot of music going on there. Um, the mix is crude by today's standards, but it's and there's that awkward moment of s dead air or dead sound when they're waiting for the gong to be played. But maybe that makes the gong more effective. You can you can look at that in different ways. But Paul now can tell us about the new King Kong by Peter Jackson. Hello, can you hear me? Am I on? Hi, my name is Paul. How are you? <laughs> I think it's wonderful that we thought of King Kong as a touchstone for this. 1933, do you know what else happened in 1933, obviously, right? Someone named Adolf became chancellor of Germany. And that precipitated the tragedy in Europe was a blessing for our culture and certainly for our film world. I don't want to say that there's a trade-off, but historically that's an interesting point because many of the composers who fled that tragedy 
became charter members of this brand new art form that was developing in California. Notice they didn't come to New York as you would have expected. They went where they could find work. And so that the first generation of great composers in Hollywood, many of them were Jewish and, and all of them were classically trained composers who brought with them their artistic sensibility, born in the Vienna Staatsoper. So for example, when Korngold did Robin Hood, for many the great score of, of Hollywood, he didn't try to make the score sound English any more than they tried to make Earl Flynn have an English accent. Uh, he wrote a score that sounds more like Rosenkavalier than Sherwood Forest to our benefit. So we created, a, they created a kind of music that we call Hollywood, but comes straight from the great days of the Vienna Staatsoper. And King Kong therefore inherited this wonderful style from Max Steiner, who was Korngold's friend and compatriot, also from the Vienna Staatsoper. And it's not surprising that he created a movie that once King Kong is introduced in that sequence, this is wall-to-wall -wall music, and it's filled with light motifs. Right? So here's a score now. There was another movie intervening on King Kong, as you know, with uh, Bridges, uh, Jeff Bridges in the 70s. This score by John Barry. Um, I know this score very well because I was the composer. Uh, in those days, they would compete. We would compete for pictures. And I was the last composer who didn't get it. <laughs> I hate him. No, I'm <laughs> We were both members of Carol Faith's studio as, uh -huh. uh, at that time. So anyway, I want you to see something now from the very recent picture by Peter Jackson, director, right? Uh, the score by a very, very good composer named James Newton Howard. He helped me pre present this to you. I'd like you to see the same scene that you just saw, a loving reproduction of it by a very great, I think, filmmaker. And uh, look at, how, this is what the composer gets. It's very intimidating. Imagine you're the composer hired to do a film. This is what you get. Here's a work print, all right? Cut to time. The only sound you're going to hear is the uh, original production track, which means the sound that they make while they're filming it itself. All of this is going to be replaced in post-production. There are some temporary sounds put in as a guide for the composer. So John, if you would, let's hear track one. Yeah. 
So that's interesting, isn't it? You see they're on a huge soundstage with a big screen, the blue screen behind them. Uh, the picture has been cut to time. Now, I'm going to go right away to the next stage of this, and we'll talk a little bit, since this is kind of an electroacoustic seminar, is it not, about how digitally sound is enhanced. You're going to hear what, we, what is called a demo or a track that the composer is required to present. This is a whole new development in, in, in how pictures are made. It, we can talk about how it affects the composer, but what I want you to see is how it's, here is how the score sounds in a, in a form that's completely digitally realized. There are no acoustic instruments at all in what you're going to hear, all right? And the composer is nowadays required to present this to the, to the uh, filmmaker, all right? Many of you will say, it already sounds like an orchestra, or some of you may say it doesn't sound like an orchestra. Let's see. But this is his digitally produced score, uh, and you won't hear any dialogue this time. You'll just see the score with picture. Notice the director has made some choices that are quite interesting. For example, you don't see King Kong's face until right at the end, and when you do finally see it, it's clearly a point of view shot. The perspective is such that the only person who can see that face is um, my favorite actress, Naomi Watts. And then the reaction shots of the director and of the, the ship's captain and these people is filled with horror. The other one, the only reaction shots you see are the natives who are unnamed, you know? So it, it pulls us emotionally into the picture in a different way. In a very real sense, these point of view shots make us part of the action. Um, now, I'm tempted. I, I want to depart from the format to ask you what you thought of the score, but we'll wait for the second hour. But most people, when they hear that, will say, why do you need an orchestra? Um, now, the, one of the things that you have to understand is a sampled orchestra, the sound source is acoustic to begin with. Um, all right. Now, the next version you're going to hear then is the acoustic orchestra itself. Now, the thing to remember about the acoustic orchestra is that it also is very large, 80 to 100 pieces, depending on which session you were at. 
And they're not playing wild, that is the conductor is not conducting freely as in the good old days when I worked at Warner Brothers for so many years. The uh, orchestra is actually playing to the basic tracks of the track you just heard. Those things are laid down first for the obvious reason that with Pro Tools and with Avid, these various computers, uh, you can set the score to the picture. It actually makes the role of the music editor, which was so essential, a different kind of mechanical interaction between composer film and, you know. So we, but we are dependent on this gentleman here. Without him, I'm nothing. And with him, I'm still nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, can you clarify the, the, the entire music mix in track in number three yeah. is acoustic? What we are going to hear is the acoustic score. You're not going to hear any samples, right? right? Um, and it's essentially the same score, but it's going to be exactly in sync with the previous one and to picture because picture came first, digital score came next, acoustic score came after that, all laid down to the same track, uh, to the same, not with click now, but with the music track, all right? So here we go. All right, uh, we'll wind up this portion by showing you the final version, which is, uh, in Hollywood, it's called the dub. The dub is that stage where you mix together all of the sound elements in post-production, which are, of course, music, dialogue, often replaced and enhanced, and sound effects, sometimes called Foley, all right? So uh, this is the dub. By the way, I mentioned that because in the East Coast, when I first started working here, um, Sydney Lumet and other New York people call it the final mix. To me, that was always confusing because mix to me means a purely uh, recording stage. But here is the version with the dub. Now, there are going to be some artistic decisions made by the director that were different from that which the composer made. The music is the same, but you'll see it, the music is di dipped at a few places where you want the dialogue to come through. And y you can see his, the decisions that were made. Now, I want the music that you hear, music still drives the scene, is a mixture 
of the sound effect. Uh, forget I said sound. It's a mixture of the music track, the, the uh, digital music tracks you heard, and the acoustic. Uh, in the old days when, when we were recording on everything to 35 millimeter, 35 millimeter stock has four stripes of information. We called them stripes. One of them was always allocated to the electronic codes called the SMPTE time code, which locked the various elements together. In other words, when we were mixing, they were locked together electronically, not mechanically. So one of the four stripes was allocated to the SMPTE time code. The other three were for music, generally this way, pad, rhythm section, and melody, which was very convenient for the rock and roll music of the 60s, where you had basically a rhythm guitar, a lead guitar, and a pad. So, uh, but, and in larger productions, you might have three or four or five different tracks of music coming in, uh, and these would all have three stripes, right? Well, I remember the first time I heard about somebody doing 24 tracks. That seemed quite elaborate. In the old days, studios had 24 track studios, right? Then later they had two of those tables, so you'd have 48, and that was music. For this movie, they used a thousand tracks. A th music, not, not of, uh, not of uh, all the other elements. Thousand tracks, six complete Pro Tool sessions. Now, I don't mean by that that some of them were just a single, they were like guitars and everything. Uh, it's, it's a world that only a digital, digital technology, and I, didn't mean a, I don't mean a team of 400 people. In the digital world, he had two mixers, I mean two people on his staff, and one overworked secretary who kept a log of all of these things. It's, it's, it's the exponential expansion of how these things work from the analog world to the digital world is scary. Uh, and it's for the young. I'm too old <laughs> to learn this. You people, the, you, it's a brave new world, and you're going to inherit it. But if you need an orchestrator, I'm, I'm here. We're, we're all young at heart, so yes. it's for all of us. Okay. So here is the final one. And, uh,
Thank you, Paul, very much for those four clips, for taking the time to put those together. And I, by indirect, indirectly, thanks to James Newton Howard for yeah. giving them to you. I, I want to make one quick comment before I pass it over. Just looking at it now, I changed my mind about something. That point of view shot of King Kong's eyes, I don't think that's uh, Naomi Watt's point of view. She's obviously knocked out. It's the directors, isn't it? They're yeah. looking, they're, they're making eye contact. It's a scary moment. It's funny how he personalized this. This director, I think he's a very good director. He loved, obviously loved the original. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of labor of love, but he added these own special touches that I think yes. are special. There, there's a lot of things we could talk about in that regard, but I want to I wanna move it. I, actually, there are so many things going on in that last version yes. that elicit elicit different responses from any of the other versions. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to throw one out. I know that I want to hold most of it for you people to talk about, but my, my reaction to the reaction shots mm -hmm. in versions two and three um, was to feel what great actors they were, mm -hmm. Jack Black and um, Aidan Quinn and others, uh, uh, because they, uh, I'm sorry, Adrian uh, Aiden Brody. Brody, Adrian Brody. Mm -hmm. um, because somehow those high sustained sounds really intensified those, those shots in a way that I felt made their emotions more visceral or more, more vivid to me as a, uh, what they were projecting. Which, but basically they're just looking at something that they're not even seeing, yes. right? They're actors pretending to see something. Yes. So it's interesting to me that in the final mix he chose not to play up the music for those shots but yes. to play up the sound effects. That's one of the many choices and that, that's going to lead me to you, Dan, partly because I assume that as an editor, supervisor type person, you're going to have a lot of, th the way you get from one of those stages to the next involves you to a tremendous amount, or music editorial work. And I'm curious to know both how you see that, sec that sequence of clips from a professional point of view, and, and you know, you talk about your own experiences in that regard, if you like. Well. Uh, it's uh, thank you very much, Marty. The the thing that would be interesting for me to know is if there was a temp score that they laid in, which the music editor uh, would have done prior to 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 James doing that. No, well that's great. That's 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 what that's what one hopes for. Is he on? Is his mic on? Uh, can you hear me all right? So, uh, thank you. The um, uh, the challenge uh, for music editors. These days, uh, aside from all the, the technical stuff that we didn't have to know prior to the 1990s, um, really is in creating a temp score. So we would that that first version of music that you heard, um, where of uh, James's uh, electronic stuff. Most of the time, what's required is a, for a music editor to create that from existing music that's already been recorded elsewhere on other movies. Um, what What's really great is if we can convince the director not to do that and just to sit tight so that the composer can come up with something. And the reason that's not – the reason that's good – two reasons. One is as a music editor, you don't want to have to do that. It's really hard to, to take music that was written for some other film uniquely and then try and make it fit into somebody's new unique film. There's just – no matter how well – you temp track uh, a movie, no matter how well you find other uh, music and cut it up and combine tracks or whatnot to make it work, it's never going to be as good as what a composer here could do from top to bottom because it, each movie is unique and different. So he said redundantly. <laughs> so, so in this kind of a situation, so that's, that's a one thing. So from the music editor's point of view, that's, that's really great. The second thing is, is that it, by allowing the composer to create something new, Rather than, well, here, let me say, we have, a, we have a, a, a term called demo love. And that is that you can imagine a music editor, um, it, you've made this film, and then you come to me and you say, okay, Paul's going to score it, but in the meantime, we want to show it to the producer and the studio and other folks. So what I want you to do, Mr. Music Editor, is to create a temp score for me. Okay, so I do that. And it takes me three or four weeks to do that. Um, and then, but the film is changing all the time. So um, they're looking at it all the time with the music in it. And finally, after five or six or seven weeks, we dub it and we have a screening. We show it to the producers and they give us notes. And then we go back and make film changes. And I have to then adjust the, the temp track I've created. And then we go out and we show it to a public audience. 
Um, I don't know if they do this in Boston, but in New York and California or L.A. area, it's, it, you frequently will go to a movie and there'll be somebody outside saying, hey, you want to go to a free movie on Tuesday night, see a comedy starring somebody or an action film song. And so, so we, we have these screenings, so people come in like you would go into a theater and you just take notes. And, uh, and we'd take your notes from you and say, you know, yeah, how, it would say, you know, rate how you like the movie action, how did you like the characters, how about the pace, you know, all that kind of stuff. And people love to think that their opinion matters, so, so people are happy to do that. <laughs> so anyway, now, okay, so by now the composer has lived, or the director and everybody else has lived with the temp score that I created. And now it's time, to eight, ten weeks down the line, for the co composer now to create or, or to record his score. And so he will give mock-ups, like you heard the electronic mock-ups of, of, of uh, James' version here. And what's very difficult is for the composer or for the director to remove him or herself uh, from the temp track that he or she has fallen in love with now and has become part of the movie. I mean, it becomes like an actor's voice. So now in comes Paul with a whole new approach. And many times, this is where composers get fired. So composers now have to say, okay, how, you know, I have to get close enough to this temp track so that it's not radically different for the director, but it has to be, I want to give it my in own individual artistic input. And I also don't want to get sued as has happened in Hollywood when composers didn't get far enough away from the, the, the original temp. Um, I, you know, that's, that's the dilemma that the composer finds himself in. So, what you'll, so, so the proof in the pudding here is that for a long time in the 90s, you were getting a lot of generic scores. You would get a generic action score, action adventure score. You get a generic romantic comedy score. And generic in the sense that a lot of us music editors would temp these, song, these movies with the same great scores, you know, that, that, that had become popular. And so then a composer would come along and the director would say, this is what I like, Paul, give me this. This is just, you know, do your thing, but I really love this. And so everything starts sounding alike. That's how you get all these things to sound alike. So anyway, that's a long-winded answer to your question on that. that of course, but there's a, the temp track problem I mean, there, there are famous anecdotes, and one of them was when Alex North went to the screening of 2001, huh. and he discovered that his score wasn't there, and nobody had bothered to tell him that Kubrick had replaced it with the original temp track that he used. Now, yeah. I think that's an impossible story. I think it's a great story, but I don't believe it, a word of it, but that's another, that's yeah. another story. The point is that this idea of temp tracking has been around, at least in the minds of some of those directors who want their own authority to be imposed on the whole of the film. Chaplin is another who wouldn't, who would insist on being the musician somehow in charge of the score, even though he couldn't write music. Mm -hmm. Like Clint Eastwood today. Like Clint Eastwood, yeah. who wants his own little piano doodlings to become right. the score. But, and maybe it's the right approach, maybe it's not. You could, you, <laughs> but I don't. Let's take a vote. <laughs> But why is it that wh what's happened is that the new, the new digital technology has made it so easy. What yeah. happens? You've got a library in your computer of all the great scores. You can just pull them up at will. You don't have to even go down the, the office corridor to the right. record library and pull them up and do, go through all the laborious process of yeah. transferring. By the way, do. Dan, nowadays the director will work directly with his film editor because we're all using the same computers anyway, the Protos for Sun and Avid for Picture. And in effect, the director makes his own temp track. Many times, yeah, and, uh, if, the, if and they have the, time, yeah. And the other thing that's happening is that because music, one of the music of today allows itself to be tempted rather easily. For example, when American Beauty came out with a score by um, Newman, uh, Tommy. Thomas Newman, um, that was so popular, and is uh, you know it was he himself would admit it was generic post minimalism that he was writing a score that was influenced by Michael Gordon and post Steve Reich, and this sort of uh, marimba uh, mallet sound 
non melodic uh, kind of yeah. that kind of music is very easy to edit on a on a computer basis it's much harder to edit something by Jerry Goldsmith or right. you know that has rubato in it for example mm -hmm. and that's not composed to a click track you, you try cutting that i know you can do it you i've seen him <laughs> he does magical things but that's a different kind of uh, that's a different kind yeah. of problem it's mu it's much easier now yeah, but I, if i could just tell the other side of that flip story of the uh, Alex Norris story, uh, my friend uh, who since passed away, George De La Rue, an Academy Award winning composer that Paul also knew and was friendly with. Um, you worked together, in fact. Yeah, and, he know. actually recorded my score for Prince of the City right. at the Paris Opera Orchestra right, right after they recorded the three act version of Lulu, which was discovered uh, in the late 80s. And that's yeah. why that score sounds so wonderful. It's not yeah. my music, it's the orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> well, so George and his wife Colette. Go to to the to the movies one weekend to see um, the color purple, and they, you know, right in the middle of the main title, they turn and look at each other because this is George's theme from a a, a film called My Mother's House, and um, what had happened is that uh, Quincy Jones had been hired to put this all together. He put a group of thirteen composers together, and Steven Spielberg wanted what they called Polaroids in, which were just temp cues. And um, as they would try, as then when they hired the person, when, when Quincy and his group went to go and um, record, they mocked, uh, kind of, they kind of mimicked George's music, but not, you know, they thought they were safe. But Stephen kept wanting, so the story goes, so I've heard, Stephen kept wanting them to do more, more like the temp. So they did it so much like the temp that George and, and, um, and uh, Capitol Records um, sued. The because um, uh, Capital was the publisher, they sued, and George said he made more money on that score than he made on any other score he ever did. <laughs> but you know, the funny thing is that score still won the Academy Award. Well, it was nominated. Was but nominated. Yeah, was yeah it didn't win. But those of us who are on the voting side, I'm yeah. a voting member of it. We didn't know to whom to give the score. Uh, the Thirteen issue. people, yeah, <laughs> right. a dirty dozen we called them. Yeah. Right. Well, what, wasn't there a film just this last year that couldn't be nominated because there were too many names? Yes, uh, this happens all the time. Yeah, and it was a good score too. The um, the, the issue, though, here is, is a strange one of control because of the new digital, the power of digital tools. Right. The fact that Pro Tools exists for anybody to use, that as you said, the director can, the director can do what Kubrick did so much easier. He can become a, quote, composer. Yes. And so you, you, and what else has changed? Why is it that, so you have the power to do it, but why is it that people now are no longer willing to trust the composer to give him the time that's needed to come up with his own ideas? Is it? I mean, Peter Jackson obviously was willing to trust Howard. Well, yes and no. He, Howard, uh, Peter Jackson's first choice for King Kong was not James Newton Howard. It was uh, Howard Shore, wasn't it? Who, with whom, yes, they uh, worked together. With whom Lord they had just done Lord of the Rings. And then uh, they were, they'd worked on it for like three months, and all of a sudden, Howard Shore was gone. And we in Hollywood were, we heard the story, which none of us believed. They said that uh, there was a difference of opinion. No, but nobody believes that. These two had worked together forever. They had just done Lord of the Rings. How could there be a, how could there be a creative difference after three months? But in, anyway, uh, James Newton Howard had three, I have my theory about that, by the way, but <laughs> James Newton Howard did the score in three weeks. Uh, and all of them have told me in preparing for this lecture, by the way, I want you to know how flattered and honored we both feel about being here in this August hall. You know, My parents thought I was a complete asshole and would never amount to anything, and here I am at MIT. <laughs> <laughs> you finally made it. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, they, when I asked my colleagues, would you help me put together this presentation, they all cooperated with, they were, so pleased. I mean, I'm going to drop a few other names, other composers like Mike Post, Law and Order, and so forth. Everybody's delighted to have this presentation here. But they told me one thing that I want to share with you. They are all required to make demos now, well, you know, what we used to call temps. Now they call them demos or mock ups. They want to make them very good because if they're not, they'll get thrown out. On the other hand, they know that if they're too good, that'll become the score. I can tell you that's what happened at Paramount uh, about four years ago. Whatever Star Trek generation we were in at the time, um, <laughs> they, the producer was requiring mock-ups from the composer. And um, one day, David Grossman, who uh, at that time was the 
senior vice president of music for television at Paramount, so he was the top guy for uh, music there. Got a call from the producer, and the producer said, I just got the latest mock-ups, and you know what? This stuff is good enough now. Um, and so I want you to take the orchestra out of the budget. No more orchestra, no more recording sessions. And because that was really the last major show on television that Paramount was doing, they shut down the lot, they closed down the scoring stage, and, um, and moved the music, you know, what few music uh, people they still had off of the lot. I had a very similar experience with a very great director, Sidney Lumet, with whom certainly this is one of the auteurs of our industry. And he did a series a few years ago called 100 Center Street with the same creative team that had created Law and Order, which is one of only two shows, by the way, shot and conceived entirely in New York. And for that reason, I'm very grateful to that show and consider it truly authentic. But I wrote a theme for it that called for a high trumpet, all right, for whatever reason. And I did it digitally, of course. Mm -hmm. But I said, wait till you hear the real version, because the real version, I had gotten Phil Smith, who's a principal pr trumpeter of the New York Philharmonic, a great virtuoso. And we recorded it. I thought this was sensational. But he had fallen in love with the digital. We already did that. We recorded it. We paid for it and all the rest, a completely acoustic version. But the version you hear on television is with the, my original demo track. Hmm. And I was at a conference back in, uh, I guess it was around 1999, 2000. It was not too long, but El Elmer Bernstein died um, in 2004, I think. 2004. And, but he was still very active in certain kinds. Of, because of the return of certain genres, he was mm -hmm. called back after years of relative obscurity, even though he's such a great composer. And I heard him speak at a conference in it, with incredible frustration and anger. And he said, you know, I've had a few years of experience in this business, and yet I'm still being asked to go on Saturday to the producer's house and do my demo score, my mock-up. I'm not going to do that anymore. If they don't mm. want, if they don't trust me, I'm not going to score their, he used a yeah. few expletives. But, um, uh, but and I, I was, I was, very moved by this because it was here you were looking at one of the geniuses of American film music who was reduced to this partly because of the technological capabilities of the medium as they've changed. It may, may, it may have happened, of course we're ignoring the economic realities which is there's so much money riding on these films that they're afraid to take risks unfortunately and that the, the old studio system for all of its faults and flaws um, had a lot more there were a lot of people like Alfred Newman around who yeah. said, give this guy a chance. Give David Raxon the chance to write the score for Laura before you use Sophisticated Lady. Right. Which is, by the way, a musical that Paul did arranging for, so I had to get that in because he has you. to get a plug. <laughs> Music um, by Duke Ellington. Yeah. Right. Um, so let's, I think it is 602, and um, right. there's a, Paul has a lot more material, that, including some of his own, but he, has, he does have clips from Law and Order, and he has clips from <laughs> NCI, and you also have a whole set of things for Blood Diamond that are similar to what you saw, which is a very different musical style. But I wonder if we shouldn't, at least now, see if you have some questions or comments on what you've been hearing and seeing first, and then we can go back to some more material if we have the time. Does that sound reasonable, David? Is that a good idea? So, who wants to ask a question or make a comment? Please hold hands up or shout them out so we can see so you. Oh, you have to come to the mics, which are on both sides, uh, yeah, halfway down. Yes, please. Did they have to introduce themselves, David? All right, it'd be helpful if you tell us who you are. Oh, I know who I am. Yes. <laughs> is, it, is it? There we go. Um, my name is Paul Lehrman. I teach film scoring and electronic music over at Tufts. And um, I, I'm enjoying this very, very much, hearing uh, this, this side of things. Uh, one comment that I, wanted, I wanted to make was that when you're talking about temp tracks, a lot of the directors that I end up working with cut their film to the temp track. Right. And so you end up having to absorb the tempos and the, the, the structure anyway, whether you want to or not. I'm sure you've come across that. But here's a question that's something that my students ask me all the time, and I don't quite know how to answer. How do you quantify the difference between an electronic score and an acoustic score in terms of what they are hearing? How do you tell people what to listen for. I mean, I was listening to, to the Howard score, what I heard was the reverb was different. And that some of the attacks on the percussion, and particularly the horns, and some definition in the strings. But, you know, is there, is there something more, is there something that you can hear that says this is an acoustic version and this is why it's superior? You're asking the question that I wanted to ask 
you because we, this is a very funny thing about uh, market research. When I was working on the Miyazaki pictures, you know, Kiki's Delivery Service, all those things, I was therefore called a music supervisor because I was doing some composing, but also I was just creating a new score. And working with marketing people at Disney, I discovered something very interesting. You know, we're not writing the scores and producing the movies we want. <laughs> we're trying to find out what you want. And one of the things about marketing in the United States is they know a lot about what you want, mostly at least if you were 13 to 26. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and it's interesting to me, the demo that uh, James Newton Howard did, the first uh, version that you heard, he wasn't pitching it towards anything. He was selling it to one person only, the, to the director. Right? So he was making a version that sounds good on a home system, a very good home system, by the way. Right? Um, but the version that, the final dubbed version, included all of those other elements, like dialogue and so forth, and decisions being made when to duck the music and so forth. And therefore, the, those, uh, the parameters of the score then are going to be mixed by all kinds of other considerations, dramatic ones, that the composer didn't have to worry about when he was making his, in effect, a pitch to the director. I don't know if that answers your question entirely. I think, I thought the question was targeted more towards the yeah. ears, wasn't it? Yeah, I think that, um, from my perspective, it gets harder all the time to tell the difference as the technology gets greater. Vienna Strings, for instance, is a software program where not only can you get the strings, uh, you know, playing every note, but they also now have it so that you can get this, the violin, for instance, moving from the D to the A flat, because rather than just programming in a D and then an A flat, you can get the transition to it, which if you don't have that difference, you can definitely hear that on an electronic score versus a, 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 an acoustic score. But, but as these things get better, it's harder. I mean, you know, they're, my ears aren't as good as they used to be, but I could tell the difference between, on an acoustic score between something that was recorded on an SSL or a Neve board. And the Neve is always a warmer sound. And so that's what I, um, that's how I kind of, it's, it's a hard thing to describe and to quantify as you've requested. Uh, that difference, but it's a warmer sound, um, and um, but less warm. All the all. The, I, what I should say is, is, the acoustic sound is always warm, but the electronic sound is getting closer as they're as they're improving it. And as this producer on uh, Star Trek uh, said, uh, on television, nobody that matters is going to be able to tell the difference, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, that's true. D I wanted to ask you in the audience when you heard the version with the demo and then the version with the orchestra, could you tell a big difference between the sound, between an, a, a digital orchestra, which is, by the way, real acoustic instruments. You know, there's no, uh, we say synthesizer, that's not quite right. This is beyond the days of yeah, analog sounds, when things were yeah. created from wave shaping, you know, a clarinet being a triangle wave or something like that. Um, the sound sources are all acoustic to begin with. So um, I'm, do you see a big difference in your ears between the uh, digital orchestra and the acoustic orchestra? Uh, and then if you do hear the difference when we, when the two, not we, but when they mix together, the two, do you, what do you hear? Do you hear analog and electric or do you hear something else? Um, I'll, I'll tell you what, I played let's, this. Let's stop for a minute. Let's, let's have a show of hands. How many of you did hear a strong difference between two and three? Good. Okay. Well, so th which did you prefer? How many preferred the digital? <laughs> and how many preferred the... What do we call the other? The other, acoustic. let's call it acoustic. Well, they co combined, I guess. Yeah, oh, do you mean the, the, the question to, my, to me is how many prefer the combined to the straight acoustic or vice versa? All right. oh. oh, okay. That's, oh, okay. A, that's a separate question. That's okay. really, but that's so, really hard to quantify. That is hard to quantify because that final because combined that, but that's, version is all mixed yeah. with but the But that's sound. part of the original design. When we do scores now, we know we're going to have the demo, we're going to do the digital and the acoustic and that we're going to do the uh, final mix. Uh, with the two. Well, All right, so which did you prefer there? I, I'm curious to know what you liked. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to be able to find that out unless you go around and ask each of them um, in, a, in a sense, and they'd probably want to hear them again in order to, to, to be more judicious. I asked that question at the electroacoustic seminar of Hans Tushku at Harvard on Monday, and this was a small seminar. There were only 18, um, con maybe there were 12 students and a number of guests. Um, and this was a very, like MIT, uh, you know, there's that school called Harvard. <laughs> and there, and there uh, they were, uh, and, and these are very advanced, it was graduate students. 
in electroacoustic. They were talking about lots of things that are way beyond anything that I know and beyond what we do in Hollywood. But they were curious to know what we did in, and I played the very same thing to the end. They said something that I was actually gratified. First of all, they thought that the demo orchestra was fabulous, you know, without the acoustic. But when we combined the two, the term that Hans Tuschku said, he was a good German student, a disciple of Stockhausen, you know, an IRCON graduate in Darmstadt. He said, um, he said that's a super orchestra. We know that it's not a straight acoustic orchestra. By the way, in, in Hollywood, we're not trying to fool you. We're trying to create something else, something, you know, whatever. You were talking about the slide from D.D.A. Flat. Didn't you tell me, Paul, the other day that now you get, you can go in and sample each note making an elision? Well, yes, I wanted to say when he mentioned the Vienna strings, he, that's really from the Vienna Symphony. And they went, and last week the London Symphony was in New York. I worked with them many times when I was working for ITV and BBC in London. They were at the Orchestra of Choice. And so they were friends of mine, and I went out to dinner after the concert in which they did all Prokofiev. And uh, they were talking about this very thing because just before leaving London, they had sampled, they had subjected themselves to a Hollywood sampling session for a company called Notion, which everybody will be able to buy or steal soon. And, uh, and he, they had to sign a contract and a waiver and so forth. And Andrew Mariner, that's Neville Mariner, Sir Neville Mariner's son and the principal clarinet was saying to me, I was against it. I told my colleagues, don't sign it. We're giving away our lives, I mean our business. I said, Andrew, if you didn't sign it, you're giving away your, your careers. Um, wh what they did was all of these sampling sessions are no longer just sampling a chromatic scale. You know, you think you, you, you sample D and A flat. By the way, D and A flat never occurs in Hollywood, so don't have to worry about <laughs> it, that. It, it's no more minor chords. It's the fundamental integral in psycho, <laughs> the score to psycho. I, could never I know, that's right. right. <laughs> so anyway, um, the... Um, when we do sampling, sam when sampling sessions are done now, it isn't just getting the pitches, but every possible nuance within that pitch, whether it's legato, and you have to sample every orchestra. For example, a diminuendo on a trumpet is very different from diminuendo on a violin, just acoustically speaking, and attack is different. And if you're going from one note to another, legato or staccato or whatever, all of those things are done. So any two chromatic pitches can have like a hundred different sampling choices. And that's what a real thorough session is. And I mention that because in Hollywood now, when a big budget picture comes along, the composer creates his orchestra first. He samples everything. I wanted to show you, if we have time, Blood Diamond, in which the orchestra is primarily percussion because it was set in Africa, and that was a choice he made. But the orchestra is set before even one note is composed, before a tune is composed, before they even spot the picture. And so that the sample orchestras that you can get now they're very expensive, like the Vienna Strings, or perhaps this London Symphony and so forth. No Hollywood composers like Hans Zimmer at Remote Control, James Newton, Alan Silvestri, would use those. Everybody tweaks, as we say, uh, these sounds. Taylor Mades, your orchestra. And, and that's one fundamental difference with the new technology from the, the benchmark of, say, the Hollywood studio era, where the, the given sound was the romantic orchestra right. with large strings winds in you mm -hmm. know the wind ensemble and the w and the complement of brass and percussion that was the basic sound now if you listen carefully to those scores from the 30s and 40s you can hear that they've already modernized them tremendously there are banjos and guitars in there there are pianos and all over the place <laughs> there's xylophones things and celeste um, max steiner loves the ping of the vibraphone kind of sound but so even that, but there was, a ba there was a baseline sound, but now it sounds like what happens is the composer starts by creating his own baseline of yeah. sounds before he even writes the music. When I first, uh, I'm old enough and therefore fortunate enough to have come into the studio system while it was just in its dying days, but they were still there. So that the orchestra that I first conducted in 1975, the concertmaster was an old Viennese Jewish guy named Erno Neufeld. And uh, this guy came because he was concertmaster at the the Budapest Staatsoper. And he played with the sound that maybe Fritz Kreisler might have played with. Mm. The, the, if you want to hear wonderful string orchestra playing, listen to the Hollywood scores from the, that era, the 30s. And I fell in love with that, that music. The music edit, the music supervisor at Universal was uh, Rudolf Fremmel III. In other words, these were basically expatriate uh, classical people from that great romantic era that Europe 
managed to destroy in two world wars. All of that culture came to Hollywood. So far from feeling bad about working in Hollywood, I felt wonderful. I felt like I was finding something that I wouldn't find if I went to Europe. Europe at that same time was rebuilding and therefore distancing themselves, certainly in Germany, distancing themselves from the music that they had so proudly created in the last two centuries. Have you ever seen a German version of the Ring of the Nibelungen? Go to Los Angeles, you'll see a horrendous production. I know everybody thinks I'm in jerk for saying that. But the, it's, new, the new production? Yeah, it's terrible. All right. you know, I, want, <laughs> I want to see breastplates when yeah. I hear Brunhilde. Well, we're... <laughs> 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 I understand and I sympathize, but we're going to move away from that topic. Um, <laughs> I'm not a fascist. I want to see <laughs> Wagner. Uh, actually, who else has a question? Is anybody going to go to the mic? Uh, somebody is here. I have a question, yeah. From the uh, Tim Jackson, I... Uh, I've worked on a number of John Sayles films with Mason Daring. And, Wonderful. Yeah. And that's... Um, Do you need a composer? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just the drummer, as they say. Um, but a lot of those cues are done right to picture because it can all be done. We just sit in the studio, watch the movie, and play the cue and figure out a, 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 a click track. That's certainly how Mike Post does Law & Order. I've been at his school. Right, okay. So I'll, just last week. So. Yeah, so that's one question is what is... What is uh, how, how prevalent is that kind of composing now where you're just in a home studio, you're watching it, you put your cue in, you're done. I mean, sales works that way on the how, cheap, how fast. How many players the did you, do you have when you're doing that? Uh, a lot of times it's just bass, drums, and guitar. Well, isn't that a part of it? Isn't it why it's possible to do If you have a full orchestra, you can't no. do that sort of thing. R right, right. But then my other question is, um, and I, I think about Danny Elfman, who starts in, you know, Boingo Boingo or whatever, Oingo Boingo. I, I remember that band very well, the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo. He lived in Venice. At exactly, and, and there was sort of a, a stigma on him composing for movies because he was just a rock and roll guy, and now he does these lush soundtracks. Uh, but he has an orchestra uh, orchestrator often. Jonathan Sheffer, I think, has orchestrated yeah. the things. Steve is, how, how often does that happen in, in the process? Well, most of the big name composers now are rock people. Have you noticed? Um, I mean, all the orchestrators. Uh, I'm not an orchestrator. I mean, I, I've always orchestrated my own music, but I'm classically trained. You know, Nadia Boulanger, all that stuff. The the composers now, like uh, Hans Zimmer, James Newton Howard. Alan Silvestri, they're all basically come from, and, and of course, Danny Alpin come from the world of rock and roll. Uh, they have their orchestrators. I'll say something about Danny. Uh, it's true, the stories you hear about some of these composers is true. Some of them do not know how to notate. Some of them do not have that kind of formal training. But one thing about Danny's music is that it always sounds like Elfman, and I like that. I like his music. It, it's true, his orchestration sounds to me more like Sibelius than Oingo Boingo. But the <laughs> tunes are always Danny Elfman. Don't you think? I think. Well, he didn't. He didn't. He never did orchestrate. And um, right. early on, he he used Shirley Walker, who was a very talented composer yeah. and orchestrator in Hollywood. Right. That Hans also. Yeah, a lot of these people, when they first came in, mm -hmm. uh, they had to find, as Paul is saying, they had to find orchestrators to make it sound like film music. Mm -hmm. But they did bring a new sense of. In the case of Danny, I would say artistry. With Hans, I, I wouldn't say artistry. I'd say it's more about sound. Right. But but certainly. Um, uh, they were, bringing, they were being innovative. You know, Paul has talked about the, the history really is, is that these early composers in film scoring were uh, classically trained, came, came from the, not only the European tradition, but came from Europe. And then the ones that started to follow them also were trained um, along those lines. But then you went into the jazz period where a lot of the people like Elmer Bernstein, for instance, John Williams is one of the the last of the hangers Henry on. Henry Mancini. But, yeah, Hank Mancini, Jerry Fielding, all these people that had, had um, uh, come through the, the big bands, and then they moved into filmmaking. And then after that, in the 70s and 80s, you started to get the rockers. You got Jack Nietzsche was one of the early yeah. guys, mm -hmm. um, Miles Goodman, and, and um, uh, the guy at, at NYU, Ira Newborn. Yeah. Um, and then along comes Danny. And, and people that follow. So we're kind of in that where the most Burwell, popular... Also a rock Carter Burwell, yes. Yeah, sure. In Harvard. fact, Thomas Newman Harvard actually had rock right. bands, right. too. Right, yeah. Right. But if I could just uh, just attempt to, to make a, a comment on, on this question in terms of the, of, of the, the process, that, um, that it's unusual. Um, uh, Mason Daring uh, is a pal of mine, too. He, he actually teaches at, um, at Berkeley College of Music. And... Um, uh, not very many uh, composers work in that method anymore. And I'll bet that you've worked with him for a while. Um, oh, there you are, yeah. Right, exactly. Well, yeah, so, you know, like 70 years, right. So, 
Mason's a really great talented picture, guy. Great picture, by the way. Congratulations. When, yeah. Great picture. But when, when you have people that play together that long, it's the old 10,000 hours thing, you know. Uh, the Beatles played a long time in Liverpool before you ever heard them. So, or I ever heard them. Um, <laughs> we. Um, so, uh, anyway, it, it takes a, a certain sensibility to be able to do that in a room. Um, when I've seen it done that way, it's usually the, the, the composer will come in with some chord ideas or maybe a melody and whatnot, and then people just jam a bit, and then they look at the picture and try and get into a groove. Well, what happens, that's how Hans works. Um, only he just does it with himself. Well, <laughs> let me take that back. <laughs> if ever there was an incorrect statement made in this building, that was it. Uh, Hans doesn't do anything by himself, um, except he'll take the meeting by himself, and he's one of the great <laughs> meeting guys of all time. Um, but, you know, like Penny Marshall won't turn on her radio unless she calls Hans and, and asks how to do it. Um, he has a way of making people really rely on him and trust him. But when he's sitting down and doing work, that's what he does. A lot of the composers work that way now. They don't go by timing notes. Do you use timing notes anymore? No. Yeah, see, so no. in the old days, music editors were, would prepare timing notes and give them to the composer, and that's what they would write to. They wouldn't be looking at any right. picture. They will have seen it the, at the spotting session, right. and then they don't get to see it again until the scoring session. Right. And they were just from typed out notes of saying, yeah. you know, at 0, 1.3 seconds into yeah. the cue, cut to the gun. And that's how you know, given your rhythm, well, I need to, you know, the, the, the third eighth note here is going to have to yeah. catch that cut. So that's where the trumpet's going to come in. Yeah. That's not, that's very rarely done now. What they do is they just put it up and they start ad-libbing to it yeah. and try and figure it out from that way. And that's the basic track that's laid down first to picture. And that, in effect, guarantees the sync that you want without having to catch clicks, to catch cuts or streamers or any of those things. Yeah. Mm. I was a classically trained conductor at music schools, you know, so that I was one of those people that could actually, t I could do a whole scene with a stick, with an orchestra, without clicks and without streamers and things. I was considered a wonderful conductor. That's a lost, it's, I don't want to say it's a lost art, it's an unnecessary art. So yeah. when I teach music now to filmmakers, I don't teach the skills that I painfully <laughs> learned because they're not necessary and it takes time away from learning the skills that you must know now. Such as, would you, oh wait, we have a question, but yeah. I oh, wanted sorry. to bring yeah. up educational issues a oh. little bit, but why don't we take a question? Hi, I'm Jason Jordan. I'm uh, actually a senior sound designer over at Sonovox, so I'm kind of part of the enemy because I made the complete symphonic orchestral collection with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. A lot of wow. Hans uses it, you know, in all his movies. But wow. one of the questions that I had for you was, at what point are you really starting scoring? I mean, it, it, is it starting in the spotting session or nowadays you're actually getting the story and like coming up with ideas and themes before you've even seen any part of the picture and then, you know, basically taking those ideas, putting it to picture, moving your timing sections around to, you know, create your scene. That probably was the it's case with, uh, it's a good question, it's but a, I, yeah, I doubt there's a fixed question. answer. Uh, because as you, as you just pointed out, that probably was the way Jackson worked with Shore yeah. on King Kong, and then no score from Shore, so three weeks later, James Newton Howard has a new score. Yeah. So all those notes, but that's certainly a long-term issue because it goes back to the uh, early days. Yeah, the process, uh, you're the very part. good question. I, can, uh, I can't answer the question like I could some other thing, by, but simply reiterating what you just said. The process changes with, the, it, with technology especially. And remember, the directors themselves are younger now. The directors are the age of some of the students here, you know? So the, it is in the old days, old, us old guys sort of directed young. It's not that way anymore. Everybody has his own fluid way of interacting with the co-workers. Yeah, Dan, Dan probably knows some stories along. I, let me just say that my sense is when you read accounts by composers, a lot of them say that they start jotting ideas down well before the actual scoring. But until the spotting sessions, there's a limit to what they can do, right? I mean, they... Well, th that's true. And, and in fact, um, I've talked uh, with several folks that tell me that, that they're not even having spotting that's sessions right. anymore. That's right. Those, se they'll just, those categories you know, don't Yeah, because they'll ship them, you know, a reel or a scene that has some temp music in it and say, you know, here, you can start working on this. Here's what we had. We kind of like this. Here's what I liked about the cue that's there, and here's what I don't like about it. And, and go. And so um, it isn't, you don't have that, 
very formal, structured meeting that involved the director, the composer, the film editor, and the music editor to sit in a room and go back and forth and talk about it and where's the exact good spot to, 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 for the music to enter and whatnot. Those decisions generally are made now by the music editor who gives them to the director, and if the director doesn't like the, the, the start or the cue, tells the music editor, that gets changed. Or the film editor, by the way. A lot of film editors... Try yeah. to put themselves with, between. With Sydney Lumet, the film yeah. editor, is the music editor now. So the last two features I did with Sydney, I didn't have a music editor. Mm -hmm. we, we, there is a music editor listed in the credits, but that's that person who assembled everything at the end for the dub, for the mix. Mm -hmm. You know, wrote down where the, logged where the stems were and all the sort of technical stuff. So we called that person the music editor. In the old days, that would have been the assistant to the music editor. So, so the I, music have a, I have a yeah. question for yeah. both of you then. You talked about what you want to train your students to do and you're over at Berkeley. Would you then, as an exercise now, give your students cues from films and say go out and write the same cue in a different way to, mm -hmm. to prepare yes. them for the temp track problem? Yeah. And do they? And so what do you look for from them? I mean, how do you help them become composers of other people's music, if you know what I mean? Well, the thing that we emphasize, and a couple of our students are here now, so uh, <laughs> they can yell at me if I'm wrong, but... Um, <laughs> The, the thing that you have to keep in mind, and this is, this is what separates film composers um, from you know, strictly symphonic composers, is that it's not, it's not about your music. I mean, your music is not as important as the film. It's about the film. Yeah. And so you are just one more element uh, in a film. But, but it, you can write the most beautiful piece of music that the world has ever heard. But if it doesn't fit in 33 seconds on that particular cue... You can't say the film to the director, you know, this piece of music, it's 47 seconds, and it's just so great. Just give me some more footage. <laughs> no, no composer does that. So, so what you have to do as a writer, as a composer, is you have to make it fit there, and it has to, it has to please the director. And the director can be a complete moron. And when the director says, listen, They're make it more morons. green, you have to make it more green, whatever the hell that means. <laughs> And so we, that, those are the kind of things we tell the students. And so um, what it's, uh, one of the classes that I like that we do is I team teach a, a class with, an, uh, with Don Wilkins, the former chair. Uh, and we have students uh, do this kind of exercise. And then he and I will comment and sometimes we'll disagree as whether they did a good job or not. Not, not good in that sense, but did they, did they hit the nail on the head or did they go too far? Did they not go far enough, you know? We'll disagree about that stuff, so just as every director will disagree on what you, as a, as a composer, turn in. So it's, it's, you know, it's tricky. It's not black and white. You know, so we can talk about the educational things. I have a, a new approach to teaching my film students something now. I, I don't give exercises like that. Tell me what you think. I make, I take the, the, stu the film composer student and marry them, so to speak, to a filmmaker from the mm -hmm. film department or AFI or something. And instead of having them write cues, they have to do the whole picture. In other words, right, because what I'm beginning to realize now is that you don't write individual cues. You know, it used to be that we, we the love scene, you wrote love music, a chase scene. You wrote, but now we begin to realize music, as you say, is part of the drama. So the important thing now is to conceptualize how you want the music to operate. So now my latest, and I don't know how, whether I'm going to be successful or not, but... Uh, what do you think, Dad? No, I think you're absolutely right. The, a film, and, and this is a problem that you get into whether you're temp tracking or you're just writing cues scene by scene. A film score has to have the same kind of emotional arc that a, that a, sure. that a plot has. Yes. And it's, it's, dra it's drama. So that realistically, if I can take a cue from reel nine and, and make it work in reel three, there's something wrong, wrong. with the music, yep. right? Yes. It, and so you have to keep that in mind as, as, you're, as, you're, as you're looking at these things and as you're designing it. And, and so what we're doing along your lines, we, I don't have the, that um, uh, a film, uh, a, excuse me, a filmmaker's program at Berkeley. So we've gone over to Emerson oh, well, and Boston. Right. Well, exactly. But it's where the same we have, thing. yeah, and we're welcome if you guys know filmmakers here. We're, we're trying to line up some of our advanced students with people that are having short films for this for this reason and also. Uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, second reason, learning how to collaborate is so essential to the process. And finally, networking shouldn't start when you graduate. No. no you have to start now. You, have to, you right. need to be building networks of people that are going to help you find work later. 
Well, and, and if you do a good, uh, just to finish, sorry, but if you, if you for instance, you score a, a, a film for a student project and that gets even nominated for an award and then you get to go there and somebody says, you know, I really like the music in that. Well, yep. the director says, oh, well, it just so happens that Sheila over here scored it. Here, meet Sheila. And now Sheila is, is expanding her network with a, a, a director that she wouldn't have met otherwise. So that, that's the other advantage of doing this. So, yeah, that's the way to go. Well, what I wanted to say was, you remember I said earlier that this is a brave new world and it's yours, and I'm pointing to the young people. Well, everybody in this room is younger than I. But anyway, the, what I'm saying is that because of the networking that the, uh, the computer has given to us, students... Uh, uh, I don't have to have my UCLA film uh, composition students work only with uh, UCLA people. Students from USC, now we, we may be rivals in football or basketball, we certainly are not in the film world, you know. There are kids at USC, there are kids at Chapman University, there's a nice Christian university down the road that put out all these really wild movies, you know, mm -hmm. mostly about pedophilia, I think. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> and, uh, and we have, uh, but you know, and AFI and, and who knows, and I know my students are saying, I heard from this kid from, uh, from NYU, now that's the other end of the right. world, but they send this, you know, you can, t so this network does happen and it's really gratifying and it's true, one of my students, we just got a master's degree and uh, hooked up through this way with a picture that got an Academy Award nomination in the, in the short, short feature uh -huh. thing. That's right. Now, we were all astonished. We didn't think he was our best student, you know? Just goes to show you. Doesn't what matter. Do what do we know in school? There, listen, there are plenty <laughs> of people that are working today that aren't as talented. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's true. A yeah. lot of the time, look, how many, gra how many film scoring, well, we, we put out about 60 or 70 film scoring graduates every year, all right? So, wow. th and we're, we have the only film scoring program major in the country, but there's certainly a lot of people studying film scoring who are composition majors and who go out to Hollywood. So, there are not that many jobs, and, and the people that get them, get them primarily through luck, okay? Now, you have to, have to be able to deliver, you have to have the talent, but luck gets you the job. Luck is you're walking by and the door opens. Luck is you go to a screening and you meet somebody, or you're at a party and you meet somebody, or somebody's uncle works on a television show and they introduce you to somebody. I mean, luck mm. plays a huge deal here, so you have to be ready <laughs> when those opportunities occur. Yeah, but there's another thing, you know, it's luck and chutzpah. Mm. I mean, that's uh, just, uh, just yeah. go for it, lie, <laughs> do whatever it takes. And, and you don't have to have jobs. Never say no. In our business, exactly right. In our business, we make our, our opportunities. Well, for example. You know, there are no studios. Just find somebody and put out a picture and then, yes. What? No, that's okay. Well, you, you could talk about your own that's right. breaks, the yeah. Death Race 2000. Yeah, I had no training, whatever, and I'm not Jewish, but I got a picture on my own. <laughs> and how I did it, <laughs> I am now, by the way, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I mean, chutzpah, you know? I was, I was at UCLA, and I helped set up the electronic music studio, the analog electronic music studio. I was a friend of Robert Moog's. I went to Cornell, and he was at Ithaca, all right? So the first electronic music score that anybody ever talks about is uh, Clockwork Orange, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and all of a sudden, everybody wanted an electronic music score, but I was tired of being at UCLA, so I quit. And I got a phone call, like, talk about luck, you were saying, and it was a girl named Julie Moldo, who was the assistant to a gunner <laughs> named Robert, I mean, Roger Corman. And they were looking for somebody. And he said, uh, Julie said, they're, we're looking for a graduate student who can do some electronic music for the science fiction picture we're doing about this race that goes, you know, killing people along the way. And I said, I'll send my best student. And I went down myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is a true story. If you go to the Walk of Fame in Hollywood, you know, where the... the, the, the stars the, on the... Yeah, the stars in the Kodak Theater. It's, that story is there, right? Yeah. So, and I went down myself, and he gave me a contract for $1,000. I thought that was my fee. It was my budget. <laughs> so, and he, and he thought I was my own student. Mm -hmm. The picture was called Death Race 2000. It was a total jump movie. It was the first picture of another guy who was running away from the draft superhero called Sylvester Stallone, you know? And this picture became a cult favorite for yeah. some reason. And I'll say this about Roger. He may be a Ghana, but he gave me a career. He gave me a full screen credit, you know? And even though I made no money, I honor this man. Yeah. He did the same for Jack Nicholson and Francis Ford Coppola and a hundred other people, a hundred times more talented and famous than I. But I consider that honorable, to give yourself a true, op give somebody a true opportunity. Do you want to talk, Jan, <laughs> just a minute about your, uh, your work with the uh, 
the digital media, the digi beta thing that you were talking or what, what would the, you have to explain it to sure, me. Sure, if bit. there's not, uh, yeah, I mean, if somebody has any other questions. Well, I was uh, thinking maybe but, that but, was your luck story, but I okay. don't know. If it, um, no, well, the, yeah, actually it was lucky. Um, I ran a company called Segway Music, and we had about 25, uh, it would range depending on how much television we were doing, actually, because um, television requires more people and keeps you busier. But we would have between 25 and 30 people working all the time. And um, uh, in the early 90s, two of the music editors working for me that were working on features, Curtis Rausch and Chris Brooks, uh, both Berkeley graduates, by the way, um, which is how I first became aware of the school. Uh, and, and, you know, you have to think that's kind of strange, right? I mean, uh, f films are, 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 are identified, filmmaking is identified really with two cities in America, uh, L.A. and New York, and to somewhat certain, you know, Chicago, and they're trying to get Plymouth Rock Studios going, and maybe, maybe that'll happen in Boston. A lot of films get shot in Boston, but it's not where all the work gets done. So that's, that's mainly L.A. and some in New York. And so the fact that the film scoring program is set up at Berkeley and not at NYU or UCLA, now, now Paul's doing that, but, or at SC, um, seems strange. But anyway, so here are these two guys working for me, and they came to me in the early 90s and they said, Dan, there's going to be something called the digital revolution and we need to get in front of it. Hmm. And I had no idea what they were talking about. For 50 years, um, since 1924, uh, uh, so actually, actually 70 years, huh? Yeah. Um, uh, music editing and sound editing had been done primarily on a thing called a moviola, which wasn't even, it was created actually, somebody thought it would be great to have to use in the home, a way to look at movies in the home. And so that was the tool that was used for all those years. But uh, these guys had done some research and been exposed to some stuff that was going on. And so they came to me and said, the only choice you have to make is whether you want to beta test a, a system called Sound Tools, which is by DigiDesign, which grew to become Pro Tools, or Sonic Solutions, which was a more expensive system and was used more for cleaning up tracks. Um, and so uh, that's why it was more expensive, actually. You could take out the sounds and needle scratches and that sort of stuff, which wasn't necessary for us because in the film world, you're recording in a pristine environment. So I... I met with uh, the folks at, at, at DigiDesign, and, and we set up this, Gosh. this. Um, Good choice. Yeah, yeah. This beta test. So the first, so so what that led to, um, Sound Tools in the early '90s then um, became Pro Tools, and we wound up delivering the first digital score from um, the scoring stage to the dubbing stage, which is Paul was saying, the dubbing stage where they mix all the uh, the sound music, uh, sound and music editing and sorry, uh, dialogue, sound, and music together. So that was a movie called um, Last Action Hero, starring anyone, anyone? The governor of California, anyone? Um, and I have to tell you, those of you who are, are, are techies um, would appreciate the fact that they hated us when we delivered this stuff. Uh, it was, um, you know, it was not very, it was 16-bit. Um, and another thing is, is that uh, the digital but the Pro Tools allows you as the operator to create your own crossfades. And in, in uh, Hollywood history, that's always the job of the mixer, the guy that's sitting, the guy or gal that's sitting at the, the panel. And so that um, in the old days, it would come in on analog, and you'd have one reel of music running out and another one coming in, and that's how you get your segue. And the, and the uh, mixer would kind of move the, the knobs here to make it nice and smooth. So with the digital film, with the Pro Tools, you're able to do that yourself. And that just pissed them off royally. Yeah. It's like, how dare you? Yeah. So, but it's come a long way from there. But, uh, but th so that was how we got involved. In, uh, and, and, and the really interesting thing about that, as I said, because it, it lasted 70 years. And then within five years of that, it became the industry standard. Yeah. Not that, you know, it's not like we created it. I mean, somebody would have done it. Uh, we were lucky to be there, but and that's the luck part. And and it was because of these two students, really, because if it, if it had been anybody that I had trained or my father or, or uh, had come to us some other way, they wouldn't have had that information. 
That's, <laughs> that's a great story. Can I ask you, did you have anything to do with the, Mo isn't there a lot of Mozart floating around in the background of the last act in Hero Score? I, I remember seeing it and thinking, why are they using Mozart's G minor or something like that? You know, that? I wish I could tell you about that. I, Michael Kamen did that score. Yeah, I know. And um, uh, Michael's not with us anymore, sadly. But uh, Curtis and Chris did the actual music editing on that show, so I wasn't there for, uh, but, for and that. But Kamen is another who also had a rock That's background, right. We right? didn't mention him, and we should have, because he may be the premier guy from that era. Yeah. Yeah. Michael was a wonderful guy. Yeah. Really yeah. terrific. Does anybody else have a question? Otherwise, I, Paul has some other clips, and I thought we should see at least one or two of them if the people are still up in the booth <laughs> and with the machines up should there. Yo, see see dude. I see you. Law and order, or do you want to see a picture? Which one? Uh, what do you want to do? I want to talk a little bit about law and order and stuff. All right, because he, it all right Paul, Paul would like, wait, we do have a question. Oh, so uh, is sorry. that Michael? Yeah. Michael Miller. Um, uh, I'm Michael Miller. I'm a senior at MIT, um, majoring in music. Um, I had the opportunity two years ago to um, intern for Howard Shore, which oh, was great. a great opportunity. Um, but in working with him, he had just actually finished this kind of s small side project. There was a um, Korean video game company that was producing this online game, and they asked Howard Shore to do the music for it, um, which kind of had this weird impact on me knowing about this, because first off, it was a Korean company asking him in New York, and he just, he never even saw the video game. He was asking me if I knew Korean uh, to go get the, to go access the game and play it a little bit. But, um, I guess there's the internal, uh, internationalization component of everything that I guess is interesting because of technology. But then on top of that, how do you feel about the interaction between film music and this kind of newcomer video game music, which is becoming more and more prominent? That's well, I, yeah. yeah. Do you want to go first? Go All right. <laughs> that's uh, not only a good question, but it, it's an intimidating question because th that's the monster that's swallowing up our industry video games. You know, it's like if you had talked to people in radio when television first started and they would have said, talk the same way I am now because we see this in its infancy already swallowing us up. I've never done a video game. I'd like to, but that's a, another, in, you know, I've done a hundred movies. I won't probably in my lifetime get one game. It's a whole different industry, you know, and they have huge budgets there and they don't do it digitally only. They do, they will send you someplace and you'll have a hundred piece orchestra and you provide an hour's worth of music. Uh, it's, it's true that the music is often based on uh, imitating a Howard Shore score. Or, you know, if, if it's not Howard Shore, it'd be somebody who's asked to imitate it, you know? But it's a huge industry. And uh, for one of my colleagues, um, uh, Laura Cartman, who's a PhD from Juilliard, a Milton Babbitt student, teaches with me at UCLA, but n now she's so busy because she's been appointed head of the game music at Sony. And at first it was a tiny gig, now it's a monster gig. And she's a terrific musician, you know? Um, what do I feel about it? I feel that I wish I could get in there, and if you can help me, I'll... <laughs> yeah. yeah, for those of you who don't know, more uh, people spent more money on video games last year than any other form of entertainment, period. More than movies, records, you know, that's, that's where it's happening. And um, interesting, the, actually, we at, at Berkeley... I'm not, I'm not intending to toot our horn, but, but I want to give you an example uh, of how powerful students can be. It just happens that, uh, that the president of the Video Game Music Club from Berkeley is here in the audience today. Hello, Filippo. How are you? Um, the, uh, here's what happened. A year ago, well, a year ago last fall, so uh, this is the fall of 07, Filippo came to me and said, you know, we formed this video music club. We have like 14 people and you know, videos, what's happening. And I, and I already had become aware of that um, because of uh, my work in Los Angeles. Tommy Tallarico was a, somebody I'd, I'd collaborated with at the Motion Picture, or sorry, at the Recording Academy, the Grammy organization. And that's where I learned about, you know, the fact that they were taking these things around the world. They have these huge concerts, lasers and interaction with the audience and s symphonies playing nothing but video game music at concerts. So, I mean, it's, it's really exploded. I remember when Steve Vai, who's a famous guitarist, and um, Nile Rogers, a guy that I worked on movies with that also did uh, We Are Family, both extremely wealthy and set for life, and they came to me about four years ago and said, hey, we're doing this thing on some video games, and I'm thinking, I think, you know, Pong, when somebody says video game music, and I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, really too bad, you know, these guys, their careers must be going in the toilets, they're talking to me about kids' games and stuff. No, not at all. 
So it really launched. So anyway, Filippo and his, and his compatriots came to me. So that club grew from 14 to 100 people within a year. And the interest was so great, I was able to go to the administration and convince them to let us hire a full-time professor and build a new lab to accommodate the video game music program, which we've, which, which we've started doing. But once again, there it is. I mean, uh, this, this is the second story I've told you now, and, they're, and, they're, and it's true that it's the impetus of students making these demands, and, and we have to be listening. We have to be hearing what's, what's going on, what changes are going on, so that we can help them prepare to go out and work. See, I'm concerned about the fact that, um, as I said, here's, we've got this film scoring program at Berkeley, and we're putting off 70 graduates or, or so a year. There aren't jobs for that, for all those people. And I, you know, they're paying money, their folks are paying money, um, and, and, and they pick artistry as a career in the, in, the, in the only country in the Western world that doesn't give a shit about art. And so it's really, it's, no, I, I'm, I'm serious about that. I mean, it's awful, it's shameful. When you go to Europe and you see um, the respect that is paid to artists there compared to what happens here, it's, it's night and day which is why you had so many African-American jazz artists move to Sweden and, and other Northern European countries and not ever want to come back. Mm -hmm. so, so, so here we, we have this, um, these people were training and, and I don't want them to go out and, and not have options. And so that's one of the reasons we felt it's important to get the video game uh, music program going so that it would be one more option for them to explore when they're out there trying to find work. You said that, um, well, how many companies now control the video game music area? Is, is it, is, is it are, aren't the studios getting into all of that, too? To there are no it? studios. Well, I mean, no. the, aren't the same companies? Well, electronic arts and... Mm -hmm. Filippo, do you want to make a comment on that? Can you answer that question? How does, how, is the music... There's a mic. There's, yeah. I mean, this guy knows everything about this right. stuff. <laughs> can, he you, knows. can you introduce yourself Almost. fully? Yeah. Sure. Uh, my name is Filippo. I'm, as Dan said, I'm the president of the Video Game Music Club over at Berkeley. Um, been working very hard to promote video game music, not only because it's a great business, as I'm sure all of you know, but also because there's a generation of, uh, of people who grew up with video game music by playing games, obviously. And uh, the whole musical aesthetic and perception of music got changed by playing video games. Um, and I count myself in uh, as being one of these individuals since I've heard more interactive music than I've heard linear music for most parts of my life now because I've been playing a lot of games, uh, clearly. And um, I think this is starting to, um, to influence young people on a level that is um, clearly fundamental. And uh, we're starting to see musicians that have been, that have been influenced by this music from, from very young age on. So I feel also that from an artistic standpoint, um, video games have to grow and have to develop a new language that um, we're kind of, I feel, getting help from film in a lot of um, uh, aesthetic choices and a lot of uh, storytelling choices we make. The video games can't really walk on themselves still uh, yet, but um, games are an evolving language and we have a, it's a way of uh, growing that um, it's, uh, it's exciting to see that um, we are starting to develop a whole new language that will eventually not have to imitate film and film music for that um, to be an artistic expression on itself. Mm -hmm. So, the, If I could just interrupt, the, the, um, uh, we, we had a panel um, at school last year and uh, made up uh, Tommy Tallarico and, and Norehiko Hibino. Hibino. Yeah. 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 So, um, and, and several other composers and business uh, executives from that world. And I asked what they thought the percentage of, of scores for video games were acoustic as opposed to electronic. Because I had assumed that, you know, it's like 90% electronic, 70% yeah. acoustic. They're spending money. The budgets are better yeah. for music in video games yes. than they are in films now. Yeah. And it's a different way of working, too. It's really interesting. The collaboration is, is different. Yes, well, and if you, I can... You've meant, you, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, uh, compositionally speaking, as a composer uh, and a musician, creating an interactive score holds so many new challenges and so many uh, different directions that you have to yeah. take because we're so used to film that we know exactly what 
happens uh, at a certain moment and you know King Kong will always come out at that <laughs> specific minute and second and you know it will be there but the considerations that you have to make um, to, for, to make an interactive score where you don't know when the player is going to meet the monster or meet the enemy um, opens up a whole new set of challenges that as a composer I feel is incredibly exciting too for everyone who is into composition because uh, it opens up a new new set of challenges. Which so there's a, an example of the technology kind of driving right. the, the, the change in, in the artistry. The avant-garde in music in Germany actually anticipated that with Stockhausen when he introduced his term intuitive music and the, mm -hmm. the chairman at Harvard right now, Hans Tuschku, is picking up on that so that you, you said something really wonderful when you talked, you drew a distinction between linear and interactive Absolutely. music. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. that also exists in certain places in, in composition. Now. Absolutely. So we don't worry so much now, are you a 12-tone composer or a tone composer? Those are old, <laughs> it seems to me, old battles that were should never have been fought, right? right? We're talking now about the whole concept of what it is to be a musician, how it is, or to be a listener. Composer. Or a Absolutely. composer or performer. But that, yeah. that, that issue of the linear versus interactive mm -hmm. structures for music is a problem that's compounded by the other. You, I, it's very interesting to hear you say it's an evolving language and we need the new because at, as is so often the case with media and transition, when you go from one medium to another, when, when film emerged, they copy. There's theater, a borrowing, yeah. And so forth, you Absolutely. borrow. Yeah. But when, when, we, um, when, we look, when I looked into video game music even five to 10 years ago, hmm. I found so little to listen to that I wanted to listen to, let mm -hmm. alone the problem of learning to be a game player. This, I'm just I telling see. you, this is a very personal perspective, mm -hmm. but for someone who grew up steeped in the film narrative, film, film medium and the idea of film as rich, richly designed narratives with layers of meaning mm -hmm. that are as rich in, as any other art form mm -hmm. in the, of narrative style, uh, of a narrative type, yeah. uh, where, I, where I had now a history of hundreds of scores by great and not so great composers that really contributed a new way of, of approaching how to write music for a, for a narrative you know, Rhyme. specific film. And then you look at these things, and, and of course in those days there were the problems of the platform technology. Sure, right? and the so the sounds were so deficient compared sure, to everything. Yeah. Now mm -hmm. it seems like within li with lightning speed, um, it's growing everything is opening up, mm -hmm. and there are unlimited possibilities. But Yes, sir. But, but every three months, I see another article in the Phoenix or someone that's a the Phoenix reviewer who says, "This is the Citizen came of video games." <laughs> <laughs> no, not happened yet. You know, absolutely. But it, and it will though very soon. It took soon. fifty it years will. for yeah. Citizen Kane to be made, and you know what? It took another twenty <laughs> to thirty before people even started to be able to see it. Right. In, in wide numbers and think of it as a great film. Yeah. And also, so they're jumping the gun. <laughs> right, and also the, um, the whole comparison, I, I can see where it stems from, but um, the nature of a game is inherently different to a movie. Um, and we're, the game industry has been almost desperately trying to convey the same emotions as film is capable of doing, but in the end, um, just like we say, uh, a composer has to deliver a score uh, and it's for the movies, for the story. The game is for the game, you know, the music is for the game and the game is, is completely different. Uh, it's a completely different form of entertainment and completely different form of art, if you will, than a movie. And um, I think instead of seeing it as a, a weakness of, uh, of games, we should see it as a as a strong point of games, but that means seeing also music that you can create for games under a different light and not as something that you know the film score is here and we'll, we're trying to emulate it as much as possible. Well, I I, okay. I understand. I'm I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I've been thinking about this a lot, and um, yeah. I like to say to people now, you know, games have been a part of human culture forever. For, forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what are the best games that have been created up till now? Maybe chess. Spin the bottle. <laughs> Spin the bottle. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. 
Duck, duck, great. Yeah. Maybe chess and maybe bridge in terms of intellectual, but can we ever think of them as narratives that are going to move us, that are going to reflect human experience? I remain to be convinced that mm -hmm. video games, for all their economic clout, for all the, the willingness of people to spend years of their life mm -hmm. in front of a machine, mm -hmm. pretending <laughs> reality, I Have remain you ever to. Yeah, you stand. I'm afraid that you're talking to. <laughs> yes, we need to repeat that. Yeah. I, either you need to go to the mic or yeah, I need I to repeat what you said. Yeah, okay. Okay. Watch out, Filippo. Okay, yes. I obviously. <laughs> you better I sit down, buddy. This is starting to be very. <laughs> I touched a nerve here. I'm sorry. I was okay. just asking um, if you had ever played through a really, you know, really high quality, long, good. Uh, RPG video game before because I wish that people who you know make that kind of argument would actually experience it not because I think you know oh you can't possibly make that argument but just because I feel like it's like saying that a symphony can never be beautiful if you've never listened to an entire symphony. Um, um, that is perfectly, that's, that's a yeah, perfectly yeah. valid point. Yeah. Yeah. If you would send me some games to play and teach me how to play them, I might. Oh. But Bel you believe you me, I can and I will. <laughs> well, but you know, this is the this is the whole issue of, the, and that's why it is a generational issue. I mean, sure. this is but, yeah. this is uh, we went when we were kids. We went to Saturday matinees. You got to see two features and and a cartoon or a short in between, and um, and so that was that was a major form of entertainment. For this generation, many of them, that w that is the major form of, uh, of entertainment is games, and so the they it's a different way of thinking about things. And the quality of music is actually exploding. I mean, when, when Laura Cartman is a major talent, and uh, and oh, and a number of people like Bill Conti, you know, who wrote Rocky and all those things, right, and won the Academy Award for you know. He, d you haven't seen his name lately. He's doing games exclusively. Bruce Broughton Bruce wrote Broughton the first um, orchestral uh, a score for a video game. Yeah. So a lot of major composers who who credits and who's his, his John Debney's doing studying. one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, by the way, I don't share your your concern for my students. I mean, you're saying that there are no jobs out there. Of course, there are jobs out there. They'll make them themselves. No, I'm saying that yeah. there aren't 70 jobs out there. If I'm sending yeah. 70 graduates, plus what you're sending out, plus what's coming out of the other yeah, schools. But you know, look. Yeah, supposing we're, we're with the economy being what it is, there's nothing stable out there. You know, no matter what business you're in, you're going to graduate and find it difficult. I tell my students now, go for it. You know, might as well have fun going going. And, and you're more likely to succeed. Uh, and uh, <laughs> by the way, here's an interesting statistic. I learned something from you. I didn't know you had 70 graduates. I mean, you know how many students? Our program's only two years old. Do you know how many students I have? Mm -mm. I have three. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope they all graduate. <laughs> um, I think it's getting to the point where we're going to have to wind this up. And it's too bad that the question Thanks to uh, Michael Miller for asking the question because, yeah. boy, he really yeah. opened a very lively uh, issue that wasn't even in the title. You know, you notice this wasn't called film, film and video game music in the digital age. <laughs> right. right. It's a very good question. And, and it is. Yeah. It is. A, it's another topic, and it does need. It does need much more uh, addressing. I think one of the key points that's come out here is this idea that for some reason in spite of the, maybe precisely because uh, of the, the nature of the video game medium, they want the acoustic sound. They don't want digital sound. They don't want, yeah. and this reminds me of the whole, the old thing about animation that uh, the great animation composer, Fred Steiner, mm -hmm. uh, told me one day when he said, you know, they know that when you don't, when you run animation without music, you see the frame, you see the, bl you see the, it's like King Kong in the original yeah. 1933. You see him lurching. You suddenly are aware mm -hmm. of things that you're not aware of when you add music to the animation. It makes it realer. It makes it more real. Mm -hmm. And it, it, there's, a, there's a process of audio and vision By coming the way, together. When I first went to work for Disney, I'd already been in the film business a long time. This was when I was in Kiki's Delivery Service. The first thing they said to me was, we don't do Foley here. You, you're going to have to provide everything with the music. Right. 
No, that's, and, now, uh, of course, uh, with video games, you have a lot of Foley, you know, because it's a whole, whole new kind of uh, reality. This is verisimilitude. I don't even think, by the way, I don't ask anymore, is this real? You know, whether we're listening to the acoustic assembly, it's all right. whatever. It's, um, <laughs> but so, so just to complete that, the mm -hmm. idea that for, for a long time, what video games were clearly emphasizing were sound design, sound effects and sound design over the musical role because they hadn't solved the problems mm -hmm. very well of interactive yeah. structures. Yeah. Now they're clearly turning to that, and you're probably right, and I'm probably just hopelessly outdated here. <laughs> uh, you know, that there will be major, there will be major breakthroughs very soon, and we may not know which ones are the really important yeah. ones for a little while. We, th that's my only, my only concern here is that people are so quick now to hail the masterpiece before, uh, without taking into consideration that sometimes the really good things are the things you don't like or you don't understand at first. It takes more time for them to be appreciated. But I want to use that word appreciation as the <laughs> segue to our exit. And um, thank, and I also should announce, uh, is there is a, now how do I do that? There's a reception, reception at a dorm on the campus down the street. It's called Senior House. You can follow some of us if you'd like to come along. It's, it will directly follow this. And um, so you will have a chance to say hello and <coughs> complain to me and <laughs> talk to the other. But I want to express my appreciation to Dan Carlin and Paul Chihara for coming from across the river and across the country <laughs> to our symposium. And thank yeah. you very much as an audience thank for you. participating. We enjoy. Thank you very much.